Chapter 52 of The Holiest of All by Andrew Murray Chapter 52 Melchizedek More Than Aaron and the Law Hebrews chapter 7 verses 11 to 14 Now if there was perfection through the Levitical priesthood, for under it hath the people received the law, what further need was there that another priest should arise after the order of Melchizedek, and not be reckoned after the order of Aaron? For the priesthood being changed, there is made of necessity also a change of the law. For he of whom these things are said belongeth to another tribe, from which no man hath given attendance at the altar. For it is evident that our Lord hath sprung from Judah, as to which tribe Moses spake nothing concerning priests. When God in Psalm 110 spake with an oath of a priest after the order of Melchizedek, it was a prophecy of deep spiritual meaning. Why should the order of Aaron, whom God himself had called, whose work took such a large place in the purpose of God and of Scripture, be passed over for the order of another, of whom we knew nothing save one single act? What need was there that another priest should arise after the order of Melchizedek, and not be reckoned after the order of Aaron? The answer is, because the order of Aaron was only the figure of the work of Jesus upon earth. For his eternal and almighty priesthood in heaven, something more was needed. Let us see and grasp this. Aaron's work was the shadow of Christ's work upon earth, of sacrifice and bloodshedding, of atonement and reconciliation with God. Aaron entered indeed within the veil with the blood, in token of God's acceptance of the atonement and the people. But he might not tarry there, he had to come out again at once. His entering only once a year, and that only for a few moments, served mostly, as we see in chapter 9, verses 7 and 8, to teach the people that the way into the holiest was not yet opened, that for this they would have to wait till another dispensation came. Of a life in the holiest of all, of a dwelling in God's presence and fellowship with Him there, of a communication to the people of the power of a life within the veil, of all this there was no thought. The glory of Christ's priesthood consists in His rending the veil and entering in for us, of his sitting at the right hand of God to receive and impart the Spirit of God and the powers of the heavenly life, of his being able to bring us in, that we too may draw nigh to God, of his maintenance in us of the life of heaven by his unceasing intercession and ministry in the power of an endless life. Of all this the ministry of Aaron could afford no promise. It was in all this that Melchizedek was made like unto the Son of God. As priest of the Most High God, he was also king, clothed with honour and power. As such his blessing was in power, and as one of whose death and the end of whose priesthood Scripture mentions nothing, and who abideth continually, he is the image of the eternal priesthood, which is ministered in heaven, in eternity, in the power of an endless life. The revelation of the mystery and the glory of the Melchizedek priesthood of our Lord Jesus is the great object of the epistle, and I cannot urge my reader too earnestly to see that he enters fully into the infinite difference between the two orders or ministries of Aaron and Melchizedek. The apparently simple question, what need was there that another priest should arise after the order of Melchizedek, has more to do with our spiritual life than we think. The opening verses of our epistle, we found the work of Christ divided into two parts. When he had effected the cleansing of sins, that was after the order of Aaron, he sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high, that was after the order of Melchizedek. There are too many Christians who see in Christ only the fulfilment of what Aaron typified. Christ's death and blood are very precious to them, they do seek to rest their faith upon them, and yet they wonder that they have so little of the peace and joy, of the purity and power which the Saviour gives, and which faith in Him ought to bring. The reason is simple, because Christ is only their Aaron, not their Melchizedek. They do indeed believe that He is ascended to heaven, and sits upon the throne of God, but they have not seen the direct connection of this with their daily spiritual life. They do not count upon Jesus working in them in the power of the heavenly life and imparting it to them. 
They do not know their heavenly calling, with the all-sufficient provision for its fulfilment in them, secured in the heavenly life of their priest-king. And, as a consequence of this, they do not see the need for giving up the world to have their life and walk in heaven. The work of redemption was accomplished on earth in weakness. 2 Corinthians chapter 13 verse 4 It is communicated from heaven in resurrection and ascension power. The cross proclaims the pardon of sin. The throne gives the power over sin. The cross, with its blood sprinkling, is the deliverance from Egypt. The throne, with its living priest-king, brings into the rest of God and its victory. With Aaron there is nothing beyond atonement and acceptance, nothing of kingly rule and power. It is with Melchizedek that the fullness of power and blessing comes, the blessing that abideth continually. It is as the soul no longer ever again seeks the foundation, but resting on it, and it alone, is built up into Christ Jesus, the perfected and exalted one, that it will be delivered from its feebleness and know the power of the heavenly life. The more we consider and adore our blessed King-Priest, our Melchizedek, the stronger will our confidence become that from his throne in heaven he will, in divine power, himself apply to us all the blessed fruits of his atonement and make a life in God's presence and nearness our daily experience. When he had effected the cleansing of our sins, God be praised for our Aaron. Glory be to the Lamb that was slain. He sat down on the right hand of the Majesty on high. God be praised for our Melchizedek. Glory to the Lamb in the midst of the throne. The holiest is now opened with our great High Priest to bring us in and keep us there. The effecting the cleansing of sins by Jesus preceded the sitting on the throne. But the application in us in power follows. This is the reason why we are here first taught about the High Priest in heaven, then in chapter 8 about the heavenly sanctuary, and after that in chapter 9 about the power of the blood in heaven and from heaven in us. It is only in the knowledge of Jesus in heaven we shall know the full power of the cleansing blood. Wherefore, holy brethren, partakers of a heavenly calling, consider Jesus on the throne in heaven. The worship and the fellowship of a heavenly Christ makes heavenly Christians.